Hey, it's a Friday night at the Voice of College Football, and what that means now, if you didn't know before, it's time to talk West Virginia football, and we got two of the very best. We got uh, Justin Coos Walker at the top right there, and we got uh, Golden Blue Dude as we break it down here for a third time on West Virginia Mountaineers Live. Gentlemen, how are we doing tonight? I'm doing fantastic. Doing great, Mark. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And uh, a lot of people joining us, I'm sure that um, at this point, uh, just watch what we've got here, the Voice of College Football. So I want them to be familiar with, uh, first of all, Koo, since you're sitting next to me here in the uh, little uh, three-divided screen, uh, where people can find you on YouTube. Yeah, my channel is Koo's Corner. It's spelled C-O-U-Z. Uh, I'm obviously a West Virginia fan, but I do national football and, and some college basketball stuff as well. I'm also on Twitter at Coos206. If you want to look me up there. Golden Blue Dude. Uh, Golden Blue Dude. Anywhere on uh, – that's on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. That's it, Golden Blue Dude. So uh, I do want to give a shout-out to uh, Coos, man. He's been he's been working hard recently, and his channel hit over 1,000, and uh, he's now in the – Last time I checked, over twelve hundred. Am I? Is that correct? Nice. Yeah, he's doing uh, good. Yeah, something like twelve hundred and seventy-two. Yeah. There you go. That awesome dude. Here. I just I hit five thousand yesterday. I guarantee that both of you hit a thousand a lot faster than I did. A lot faster than I did. So I'm going to be looking up at you two here at some but point. But you laid probably. the groundwork. You laid the groundwork. <laughs> so uh, the later generation of YouTubers benefit from guys like you. So Absolutely. now it's easier. And now we're laying the foundation for people that might come after us. I'll take it. I will take it. That makes me feel a little bit better. All right. Good stuff from these guys. We'll talk West Virginia football. Of course, um, before we get rolling here, check us out on the West Virginia channel. So I'm guessing about 90% of the people that are watching right now and will be watching uh, here in the next hour are watching on the main channel and uh, the Voice of College Football. So check out our West Virginia channel. What I did, I put the link uh, right in the live chat there. It's about the third or fourth comment down. So grab that link, subscribe to the channel right there, and we will provide Mountaineer content for you, shoot, several times a week. And that's our pledge to you from all sorts of people, including these two and myself. If I've got anything of value to say about West Virginia football, I'll have something to say. All right. So first and foremost, Jared Deggie and um, Golden Blue Dude and I talked about this um, last week in regards to um, he got knocked around, Justin, quite a bit from the uh, the West Virginia faithful at times. Well, what are your thoughts on his performance uh, as a Mountaineer? It's good and bad. Uh, one week he looked like the best quarterback we've had since Geno Smith. Next week he was uh, throwing pick sixes and getting sacked ten times. So it, it's uh, it was that's why uh, just inconsistency basically is the story of his of his tenure at West Virginia. Very hard worker. Uh, very good guy, done things the right way, a great leader. He, he's got everything you want as far as the intangibles, but just had some just had some problems that he just wasn't able to, to solve. And it wasn't all his fault. He didn't have great help around him. But, but I, I think he may, I think it, the right move was made by him leaving the program, but for him and the program both, honestly. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, he had a decent – season last year, but we had a much better offensive line. I think Jarrett Deggie's biggest issue is making critical decisions under pressure. Um, if you give him a lot of time and he can hit his targets, he's, he's a decent quarterback. We, we saw him throw some really good balls in the Iowa State uh, game. Uh, that was a good win for West Virginia. But our offensive line was inexperienced, and he just he didn't have enough time to make – his decision making isn't as quick as it needs to be. Uh, he, he has decent mechanics. Um, he, he's fairly okay at at reading his options, but it's the quickness of his decision making that needs to improve drastically. I totally agree. My my take on Deggy is this: he uh, he's the type of quarterback that if he has help around him, can be can be really good. Absolutely. But he's not going to win games by himself. 
He's not that – he's not an elite, basically, is the way I would say it. He, he needs a lot of help, and we just – we didn't have it to give him. That, that's exactly what I was saying. He's He's good enough to not lose you a football game if you have the talent, but he's not good enough to uh, – to put the team on his shoulders yes. and win the game for you. That's why he's I good enough to not lose the game, but he's not good enough to win the game. If that makes any sense, I, that's exactly the exact same thing I was saying, just in a different, much easier way. So we closed out his Mountaineer career against Minnesota, of course, eighteen for thirty-one for one hundred and forty yards and a pick. Uh, Chris, you pretty much nailed um, the game in terms of our preview of how it was going to be. Not that West Virginia couldn't win the game, but you were pretty doubtful and felt like it was going to be an uphill struggle trying to put points on the board. And it definitely was. Yeah. It 100% reminded me of the Oklahoma state game and going into that game. I had hope because I knew Oklahoma state didn't have a great offense and it, this was, it was going to be a defensive battle and we, we held Oklahoma state 24 points. But our offense is not good enough to score an elite on an elite defense. Same thing against Minnesota. We held them under 20 points, 18 to 6. If you watch the entire game, Minnesota dominated, even though they only scored 18 points. We could not move the ball. And the biggest thing, um, a lot of people didn't realize this. Minnesota is really good at getting field position and flipping the field. On the other side of the coin, West Virginia is terrible at flipping the field and uh, having good field positions. So that and that, if you watch the game, that played a big factor into the outcome of that game. So uh, yeah, it, it didn't surprise me at all. I, I wanted to have faith. You, you always want to go in thinking that your team has a chance, which they do. They always do. I just didn't like the matchup at all. I didn't like it. Oh yeah, I was up until uh, what one forty-five in the morning watching the game. Absolutely, I was. Uh, Tony Mathis, uh, Justin Johnson got uh, the carries in this one. We know that Letty Brown couldn't suit up or didn't choose to suit up in this one. Uh, how are these guys in regards to relying on the running game next year? Um, you know, losing Letty Brown is going to hurt. He he was you know he was our go our go to running back, but I do like what we're getting. Tony Mathis was starting to look better and better the last three games. And we got the four-star recruit uh, transfer, Lynn J. Dixon from Clemson. Uh, we also got the All-American running back from Delaware State. So we're actually going to have a, a pretty decent running back core. The, the biggest issue with the, with the running game is, once again, that offensive line. Now that they have a year under their belt, they, they were very inexperienced, um, didn't know each other. You know, chemistry is a very important part on the offensive line. Um, it just It seemed like, they didn't have it. Now, they started getting it towards the end of the season, and you could tell the running game started getting better. But for most of the for most of the season, they didn't have chemistry. So the big thing that I'm going to be looking at is uh, chemistry early on in the season, opening up those holes and being able to protect uh, whoever our starting quarterback is. Yeah, I agree. Um, I like Tony Mathis a lot. I actually think he has the potential to be better than Lady Brown was, to be honest. I agree with that. Because of his quit, he has a little bit, he's got you know more fast twitch. He's got some some twitchiness about him that Lady didn't really have. Lady was more of a downhill guy, like Chris kind of I think Chris mentioned. And uh I tell you, and they say Lynn J. Dixon is extremely twitchy. Uh oh yeah. So we're gonna we we've never really had a change of pace guy. Uh, we our running back room was filled with downhill runners for the most part. So bringing Lynn J in is going to give us a change of pace. So I'd, I'd actually like to see both of those guys get a lot of carries. And I think that's ultimately what the staff wants is to have multiple guys carrying the rock because they just wore Letty down, man. We didn't, because we didn't, he didn't have anybody that could spell him for about half the season. Yeah, so, absolutely. And uh, that was one of the reasons why we got that running back from Delaware State. That mm -hmm. guy is your downhill runner. So you have yeah. Lynn J and Tony Mathis with the shiftiness. But if we still need that tough, you know, two yards for a first down, we'll have that downhill runner as well. And I tell you, I've been impressed with Justin Johnson. I think that kid yes. can be special too. He, he struggles in the blocking game. I think that's one of yeah. the reasons he didn't get a lot of playing time. But I think once he learns how to block in, in, at the Power Five level, I think he's got, got the uh, – and don't forget, we've got that uh, 
uh, the other kid, I think it's Jalen Anderson, if I'm not mistaken, is his name, Chris? Or yeah, Blue that's Blue. correct. Yeah. I'm not sure what's going on with him because uh, wasn't he the one that was kind of late signing and he, he hasn't was. signed yet? He, well, has he, he, did, signed? he did finally sign later, okay. it was later in the season. He had some he had some academic stuff he had to work through, but he finally worked through it. And he's now officially right. on the roster, the last I heard now, unless something's changed. So we've got yeah, a pretty that's big, a big that's a big deal. A pretty big yeah. running back, deep running back room right now. Yeah, I forgot about uh, Lynn J. Dixon coming your way. Mm-hmm. So oh, yeah, that's serious. I'm sure right you guys now. would be okay with his uh, productivity as a freshman, eight point eight yards per carry. I think that would do do Man. all right for you. Uh, and this, uh, you know, Chris, when you talk about uh, the running game leaning in off on an offensive line, and you've you know anything about what's happened to Clemson football over the last few years and their number one issue. Some people would say DJ Uyangalele, but offensive line is that uh, 8.8 and 6.5 yards per carry his first two years, and then that dropped to 4.5, 4.8 the last two years. Yeah. So Lynn J. Dixon didn't forget how to hit a hole or you know, how to read blocks or didn't get any worse. Uh, that's the Clemson offensive line not being nearly as good as it was when they were getting deep into the playoffs. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm hoping that we see chemistry immediately out of the gates because, uh, you know, we see how it affects running backs. So Lin J, you know, could be one of our better running backs. But if that offensive line doesn't come around, then he's in for a tough year just like the rest of them. So I'm really hoping our offensive line is better this year. Is there anything else that happened in the bowl game that uh... – Stood out for you guys in regards to 2022, either good or bad? Uh, well, you know, Letty set out. Jarek Deggy is gone. Um, defense did what they were supposed to do. So, as far as anything popping out, not not really to me. I mean, what happened, what I expected to happen, happened. I do think that we need to work on the, the field position game. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Minnesota had a tremendous advantage flipping the field. And, get, and getting great field position. We have got to get better at, you know, giving our offense better field position um, because we're starting, you know, 20, 25, 30 if we're lucky. If we can if we can bump that up to, you know, 35, 40, that, that would help West Virginia tremendously. Yeah, and they're working on that. They brought in an Australian punter. Exactly. Class. Yes. From that, from that Pro Kick Academy or what? I think that's the name of it, out of Australia. The kid can kick with either foot. That's yeah. how good he is. He can, and, kick, you know, he can kick rugby really style. Good. He can kick a spiral. He can kick it end over end. He can kick it however you want him to kick it. Yeah, and the weird thing is he was only rated a two-star, but that's because his leg isn't considered, you know, four-star strength. But he adds all those other elements that return teams are not used to. You don't know what foot he's going to kick from. You don't mm-hmm. know what style he's going to kick. So, you, I mean, it could come down to you don't know where to stand. Do I stand on the left side? Do I, I mean, how's it going to bounce? Is it, you know, so I like the diversity that he brings in. Absolutely. So Talking Mountaineers. The addressing the, I think the coaching staff is addressing the areas of the team that need addressing through, through recruiting. Right. I agree with that. Talking Mountaineers. We got uh, the golden blue dude. We got uh, Justin Coos uh, Walker as well uh, here talking up um, – the Mountaineers, uh, good recruiting class here in 2022 and uh, headed toward uh, a long, long off season. That's the unfortunate thing about college football. It is a long time, yeah. boys. That's a fact. Yes, it is. What, Too long. I made, a video the other day. I made a video the other day uh, saying, you know, the game that we look forward to the most is also the game that we dread the most because, you know, the national championship, that's, that's the biggest game of the year, but we know that that's the – the very end of the college football year. So it, it always comes fast and, you know, as usual, right on time. Yeah. People count in NBA season, uh, November, December, January, just count the months of an NBA season. You, you pretty much circle the calendar, <laughs> a, a count a baseball season, which a lot of people think are, is longer than an NBA season. It's actually shorter. They just play a lot more games, but anyway, they're, they're long. They're seven, eight months long. Not a college football season. So here we are. First week of January. We're going to have to wait till the first week of September. Eight months. 
to see a college football game after Monday. I'll yeah. try to get through it somehow. <laughs> it is tough. It is tough. Yeah. But the biggest thing, the biggest thing that I'm seeing right now from West Virginia fans is they're absolutely freaking out about the transfer portal. Um, last count, it was like 29 or 30 players from West Virginia uh, have entered the transfer portal since last year, I believe it was. And I was like, all right, I, I need to look into this because, uh, you know, they're freaking out. So I looked into it. And, you know, yes, Jarrett Deggie entered the transfer portal. But in the season, everybody was complaining about him saying he needs to go. He needs to go. So you shouldn't be complaining about that at all. So take that off the board. Uh, our best wide receiver, Winston Wright Jr., right? He enters the transfer portal. Well, he may be our, our, our leading wide receiver, but he still didn't have, you know, that great of a season because we didn't have a good offense. And you go on down the list, uh, Sam Brown, two receptions. Sean Ryan, 25 reception. That's some production. The way West Virginia fans need to look at this is what was not working last year? The offense. Who was part of that offense? These players that are entering the transfer portal. So you're seeing the players that were part of a bad offense entering the transfer portal, and that makes you think that something bad's going on in West Virginia? See how that doesn't – Mm, it doesn't really make as much sense when you sit down and think about it. They go by sheer volume. Most of those players didn't see hardly any playing time or no playing time. Uh, just those four that I mentioned, uh, including, well, Jackie Matthews on the defense, uh, you know, our offense was terrible. So you have to switch things around. And, you know, we don't know what goes on behind the scenes. Maybe the, the coaching staff is like, well, we're going to switch to this. And they're like, man, we don't fit with that. And so they went to the transfer portal. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of unknowns that go into it, not just, man, our coaching staff, they're running off our best players. Uh, yeah, but look at our offense. You know, wasn't very good. Yeah, I agree with you to an extent, but also, I mean, I understand the concern because we are losing guys. Like Winston Wright was our top receiver and, and our kick returner. Yep. Uh, Isaiah Esdale was productive at receiver. Sean Ryan was – I mean, all those guys caught touchdowns. All of them were really uh, – two of them were starters. Yep. But the, but but here's what – but the thing about S. Dell and about Ryan is those both of those guys were seniors anyway. Yep. So they're actually grad transfers, and I don't think that's as big a deal because if it hadn't been for the COVID year, they would have been gone anyway, right? Uh, Winston Wright, to me, is the one that's a pretty big loss. Um, because he was and, – and, and I think he was a big loss more or less – more so from the kick return standpoint just as much from the receiver standpoint because he was extremely good back there returning kicks and could take it to the house at any time. Uh, and he was really the only receiver we had that I would call a, you know, fast twitch uh, slot guy. Everybody else was kind of long and long lean, can stretch the field. He, he's that – you know, that short guy that you throw a screen pass to and he takes it to the house, right? Yep. So, you know, hopefully – I'm sure they got somebody that can fill that role or at least we'll go out and get someone, hopefully. Uh, the only thing that concerns me, and I don't mean to – you know, I don't like to be uh, negative, but I heard an interview the other day with Stedman Bailey, a former great West Virginia receiver who was a Blitnikoff finalist here and holds some records, played in the NFL. Uh, he, he's in constant contact with the receivers and, as I, and actually comes back to visit a lot. And he says that there is a lot of uh, miscommunication or uh, there's some things going on within the program, especially at the receiver position, that does that concerns him. I saw that. Yep. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. You know, he wouldn't go into detail, obviously, because he didn't want to give out too much information because it's said to him in confidence. But. You know, there is some concern there as to why all these wide receivers feel the need to go somewhere else. Yeah, I think you could see that on the offense uh, as far as a communication issue because uh, an offense that communicates well isn't going to look like the offense that we saw on the field. So, yeah, I, I 100% believe that, and you saw it on the field. And uh, I, I've been concerned with that the entire season, and that probably played into a factor with, you know, these receivers going into the portal. The good news is we do have uh, Bryce Ford Wheaton coming back. 
Caden Prather, man, I am excited yeah. about that dude. He started to uh, really come into his own uh, throughout the season. And we have some pretty good uh, receivers coming in from the uh, recruiting trail. We have Gerald Williams and Jeremiah Aaron. Those are the, the two biggest names. Uh, I'm very excited about that. So we have potential uh, talent that can step in for what we left. Now, the, the key is what we lose is experience. And, yes, that does matter. But we are getting fresh talent in. So that's why I'm not, you know, uh, sky's falling type of situation. Right. Uh, it's just that experience factor. And it does matter. It does matter. But I would counter with this. Maybe it's time for a shakeup because the, the offense has gotten stale. And, you know, I, I hold no ill will to any of those players that entered the transfer portal. But something had to change. And if part of it, was those players going to the transfer portal for the betterment of the offense, then, you know, that's exactly what needed to happen. The communication issue does need to get fixed. I will say that. Very, very important. If there's a, a, a communication gap or a breakdown somewhere, it's got to be fixed. Yeah, and and but one thing, too, to keep in mind, back to your sky's not falling analogy, which is true, all the guys that are leaving – were Dana Holgerson recruits. So Neil Brown and Dana Holgerson are two completely opposite coaches, different personalities, yeah. different philosophies, different cultures in the program. Not saying one's better than the other, but they're totally different. And I think there's a huge disconnect. I, I said miscommunication earlier, I meant disconnect. I think there's a huge disconnect in how the Holgerson recruited guys maybe want things done versus the way Neil Brown's doing them. Absolutely. So a lot of those guys don't, don't like it. So they're leaving. But what that means is, as, as hopefully as, as Coach Brown starts getting more of his guys in, everything will start to turn and turn for the better, hopefully, because because it'll be everybody will be bought in to the culture he's building. Yeah. And that's the one thing that West Virginia fans are going to have to have is patience. And, you know, I know it looks like that West Virginia has gone backwards. Uh, if you compare this year to last year, then, yeah, I could definitely see that. But if you compare this year to 2019, the first year he was here, it's actually not gone backwards. We're just kind of in a transition period. Now, how long that's going to actually take before, you know, all the players that he needs to do what he wants to do takes, um, that's the biggest issue. But the thing that I really, really like is it seems like Shane Lyons is bought 100% into Neil Brown. So I, I'm not I'm not trying to downplay the the opinions of West Virginia fans, but to me it seems like as of right now it doesn't matter. Like uh, all the chatter of fire Neil Brown, uh, you know, trust the slide they turned into, you know, all that stuff. Right now it doesn't matter because Shane Lyons is bought into whatever plan Neil Brown laid before him, and from what I heard, it was it was a thick, thick stack, you know, of papers in the notebook. So it was very detailed, laid out. He's bought in. Um, he's not going to be fired this year, and probably it, it would probably two two more years of bad football would is what it would take for Neil Brown to get fired because uh, the athletic director is is bought in and is giving Neil Brown time. And if you think about it, if you're not just building a program but rebuilding, which is what Neil Brown undertook, rebuilding West Virginia football. It takes three to four years to start seeing results. So uh, we should start seeing uh, better results this, this coming season. I think Chris and I have covered this ground in the past. So, Justin, I'll ask you, what, um, what would be your expectation if West Virginia football is where it's supposed to be? Neil Brown gets it going in three years. What, what does that look like to you? In three years, we should be winning 10 games. In my opinion, nine to ten games, consistent. Okay. All right. Three, wait, wait a minute. You mean three years from now or three years? Just, just the, what? What are the expectations for the program? What? What yeah. should be the expectations for the program? Whether it's three I, years or thirty years from now, I got you. Whenever, just what? What should this program? What is it capable of doing? What's realistic? Okay, real. I, I think eight, nine, eight to ten wins a year consistently is where our program has consistently been over time under under Don Nealon, under Rich Rodriguez, 
Even under Dana, we were winning about eight a year. Uh, so on average. So I think eight wins should be the minimum expectation for a, for a football coach at West Virginia. I think the one thing that people forget about West Virginia, and it was under – now, the, the big exception was Rich Rod. He, he, had, he had a stretch of great years back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back. To back to back to back. Um, West Virginia isn't the type of school that's going to get a top 10, 15, 20 recruiting class year in and year out. So uh, it, it, it's a type of school where experience combined with, you know, those recruiting classes coming together. So for me – and from what I've seen growing up is once every four to five years, West Virginia has that really, really good season, you know, 10 wins, 11 years. And then in between, you see the buildup, uh, then the rebuild. It's kind of like a little mini rebuild in between. So it's like every four to five years, you'll see that 10 wins except for Rich Rod. And then you'll see uh, the drop off to where we have a, a really bad team, to be honest with you, four to five wins. And then after that, you know, seven to nine, and then that magical season again. And it was almost type of a, a, a rinse and repeat. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say eight to ten every year because you're going to have those years where you lose a ton of talent. Uh, it even happened with Holgerson that four win season in 2013. Uh, but I would say uh, for the good years. I, so three out of five, three out of every five years, yes, eight to ten wins. But you still got to give them those two years uh, for that mini rebuild every cycle. So you know you're looking anywhere from five to seven wins in, in the mini rebuild between the gaps. I agree with that. I, I, I was referring to an average of eight to ten a year, but yeah, you're correct. I agree with you. We're on the same page. So, so we're not going to put uh, West Virginia trying to uh, reach the the pinnacle or the elite of college football, but we'll drop it a tier or two and I'll throw out a couple programs off the top of my head. Wisconsin comes to mind. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Wisconsin comes to mind. Uh, Stanford when they were winning in the first half of the decade, I, I'm Oklahoma just trying to State. think of Oklahoma state. Yeah. Because golden blue dude, when you were, going through the cycle of the way this looks and peaking, you know, if you look at Wisconsin, there's not that sure. Every, every program has better years than other years. Not every program is going to go nine and three every year. Obviously right. there's dips and valleys, but they don't go through a cycle. Like you, you can't look at Wisconsin football and see a cycle. You expect them to go nine and three or 10 and two every year. Is, is there any way to avoid what you're talking about and being being plagued by that dip. There is. And it's what Neil Brown's doing right now. Recruiting, recruiting at a higher level. Uh, you know, Don Nealon was a great coach, but his recruiting, not elite. It was good, but not elite. Uh, you look at uh, Dana Hogerson. He was actually a terrible recruiter. What he would do is he would go out and get high level uh, JUCOs, but you, you never knew when that good year was going to come because sometimes uh, JUCO you know transfers are, are better than others as far as the availability. What Neil Brown is doing is uh, he's doing what you need to do to avoid those dips. Uh, we have one of the best recruiting classes we've seen in over a decade uh, under Neil Brown, and if he can keep doing that, oh. then we can, af we can avoid – Must have um, lost uh... – Chris, oh, he might be coming back for us. We got you. We, we got you. Now? Keep rolling. Sorry. Uh, you're good. Yeah, if he, re if he keeps recruiting at the level that he, he recruited this year, and he could probably recruit better than that, um, we can avoid the big dips. We, we might have, you know, those off years where we'll have uh, seven to eight wins, but we can avoid those years where we drop, you know, down into the four and five win category. So the key to that, of course – Recruiting. I mean, look at Alabama. That they recruit top five every year. That's why they avoid the dips. It is all about recruiting, and that's why we saw major ups and downs under Dana Hogerson. Uh, 2018 was an amazing year, but in between that, one one ten win season under Dana Hogerson, just one, and that was in the year when the Big Twelve wasn't great. The two decent teams that we played, we got beat. Going into that game against Miami, I, I'm like, guys, y'all need to be prepared. We're going to get smacked around by Miami because the Big 12's down this year. 
Uh, we should have ran away with the Big 12 that year, and we didn't. Uh, Skylar Howard was was a good quarterback, but not elite. That was the biggest piece we were missing that year. And sure enough, Miami, you know, they smacked us around, and we ended up going 10-3 and three that year. Uh, besides that, uh, it was big hit and misses for, for Dana Holgerson. So this uh, comment on the screen from our guy Yakov22 may lead into a portion of the conversation that we're going to hit on uh, at some point. So life in the Big 12. <laughs> so Golden Blue Dude, if I – and we have talked about uh, life in the Big 12 for West Virginia. It's disconnected by however many states from whoever's closest. Iowa. Iowa State. Yeah. Iowa State. Yeah. Uh, the state of Iowa. So, um, but BYU, Cincinnati, Houston, UCF. Well, Cincinnati would be the likely candidate to be a rival. So if things stay as is, uh, life in the Big 12 could change and and will change because of, um, you know, no Texas, Oklahoma, but the addition of four other teams and one right there in the region that if they uh, continue to play the football that they've been playing for the last three or four years under Luke Fickle. And yeah. Cincinnati has been a, been a reputable program for years, decades. Um, how do you guys feel about that being something Cincinnati, West Virginia. Uh, it's going to be something. Uh, we had uh, a little taste of that whenever Cincinnati and West Virginia were in the, the, the Big East. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a good little rivalry back then, and it's going to be a good little rivalry now. It's not going to be a, a West Virginia Pitt or a West Virginia Virginia Tech, but it would be, it, it'll be close. I would put it right there with maybe a West Virginia Louisville or West Virginia Syracuse back in the Big East. Uh, I, I'm going to be looking forward to that game on a yearly basis for sure. I agree. I mean, to me, it's just a fit. It's going to be the only team in the conference that's regionally. Uh, if we don't do something, if we don't try to make it a rivalry, it, it would be a mistake, <laughs> to be honest. Big mistake. Because we need we need a conference game to get excited. Not that we don't get excited about conference games, but it means more if you get, if it's a rival. Yeah, I, we, and we, you know, we, they we added need, we need something in conference to be a rival again. I mean, they added, you know, four teams, but Cincinnati's the only one that's right there. I mean, UCF, yeah, they're on the East Coast, but that's almost the same distance as, uh, you know, to Iowa State or out yeah. the Midwest. So yeah. just because they're on the East Coast doesn't mean, you know, they're close. Exactly. Yeah, those uh, all those programs uh, bring something to the Big 12. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, I posted a video, and I'm sure, Golden Blue Dude, you posted – several videos i'm sure about uh, the addition of those programs into the big 12 and if you really look at what they've produced over the last five or six years yeah you're you're taking away bigger brands there's no question but the big 12 tried to make up for that with or with quantity over quality to a certain extent but there's still four quality programs and i really think that ucf is the um the diamond in the rough to a certain extent, uh, Florida recruiting NIL Disney uh, and, and UCF has shown in the last five or six years that they're serious about football and they really want to win and uh, shoot. They just beat Florida in a bowl game and with the state of Florida, Florida state and Miami should be better here soon. Um, yeah. They could be a factor down there. And of course, Cincinnati now. And what they're doing. Houston had a nice comeback year this year. We know what they were doing five, six years ago, where they had a nice stretch of football. And their 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 history in the Southwest Conference is is uh, really strong. And BYU is kind of the oddest brand in college football. I, I don't know exactly what they are in terms of they're not Notre Dame, but they just hang out there as an independent, and all the other independents. In college football, are a bit of a joke. You know, UMass and Liberty and New Mexico State and these fledgling kind of programs that are just out there. UConn's an independent now. Uh, it makes no sense to me why you would want to be an independent when you've got no weight, no power, no value. But BYU, they're able to make it work. Uh, but now they're joining the Big Twelve. So it, uh, 
Uh, I think the Big 12 did as good as it possibly could have. Um, Because I certainly was of this thought. I don't know where you guys were when the Texas-Oklahoma news came down. So that that takes a conference from from 10 to 8 when everybody else is in the 12 to 14 range. And from there, you got to, and, and you're talking about only two out of 10 schools, but you're talking about probably half the value of the conference, something like that. You know, you're talking about the two money makers. And what has traditionally happened when we've seen uh, conferences explode or expand one or the other when they either survive and grow or they dissolve like you guys have had to experience with the big east that you either go out and you make a move and save yourself before it crumbles because everybody starts to get nervous in the conference and we heard all sorts of rumors about certain teams jumping to the big 10 or going here going there and going to the Pac-12, there was a lot of talk about. And and if you would have lost, if the Big 12 would have lost, gone from eight, then it goes to six, and then everybody scatters and saves themselves because there's no way you're going to sit there with a dying ship. Uh, so they did a nice job of countering that before it fell apart with about as good of four football programs as you could find that were available. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's and that's the exact reason why uh, West Virginia is in the Big 12, that they saw the Big East going down, sinking like a ship. Uh, but if you go back and look, Louisville waited. What, Louisville was actually in the Big East uh, after West Virginia left. They were in the Big East one more year, and they ended up in the ACC. So I've always looked back, and I wondered, man, if West Virginia would have just been a little bit more patient, not panic, not panic. Maybe we'd be in the ACC already. It's all hearsay now. We'll never know. But, uh, yeah, but to your point, uh, whenever you see your conference crumbling like that, you're you're looking, all right, we need to be somewhere. And West Virginia ended up in the Big 12 because of that. Uh, so, yeah, I 100% agree with that. And I think adding Houston, while Dana Holgerson's the head coach at Houston, at least, that will be a rivalry with West Virginia. I, I 100% guarantee that. Uh, I don't know about West Virginia going to Houston, but I guarantee you, whenever they come to Morgantown, uh, they're going to get it. They're going to hear it, and they're going to get it, um, especially as long as Dana Holgerson's the head coach there. Yep, I agree. I could end up building into a decent rivalry, potentially, if he stays there a while. Yeah. Houston's brand is getting better and better. So, you know, they brought some value in. I think the Big 12 got Houston at the at the exact right time. I think Houston's peaking right now. Um, they had the possibility of trending back downward. They haven't yet, but they had the possibility. Now that the Big 12's got them, that's probably not going to happen. So the Big 12 really, really got them at the exact right time. The high school football talent in Houston is crazy. <laughs> Crazy, ridiculous, deep. Uh, the Ed Oliver Houston team that beat Florida State in the Peach Bowl. I remember during the course of that season, the season they went 13-1, and one, there was a stat out that they were able to build a roster unlike anybody else in the country where there was nobody on their roster more than like 35 miles away from downtown Houston. Like they built the whole football team staying in Houston. Now most, of the great, now, most of the great football players in the Houston area are going to Texas A&M or Texas or LSU or wherever. Uh, but if Houston being in the Big 12 now can say, hey, we're in the Big 12, you can go to major bowl games and uh, compete on the big stage, and they may be able to start latching on to a lot of those guys. But, uh, yeah, Houston, like Atlanta, is just crazy deep in talent. Oh, yeah, I agree. I think it's one of the reasons Dana Hoverson left. Dana Holgerson, if you look, a lot of the West Virginia media wouldn't say this when he was a coach here, but after he left, word came out that Dana Holgerson was a little lazy when it came to recruiting. He did not go on a lot of recruiting trips. He yeah. made his assistant coaches go. Well, he picked when the you, right place. When you coach in West Virginia, you, we have to recruit the entire country. I mean, heck, Neil Brown's got three guys from overseas on the team now. Um, I mean, you, you've got to travel everywhere because we just don't – we're such a small state and we don't produce the high school talent that these other places do. 
So Dana could go to Houston and he don't have to leave his freaking city. He can stay right there and recruit and get – he could pretty much fill his team without leaving Texas. So that's perfect for him, honestly. And I think I honestly think he'll do well there because it fits his personality. It fits his recruiting style and his recruiting, uh, you know, the way he recruits. And, uh, you know, he, I don't think he had the – and I don't, I'm not saying the guy's a bum, but I don't think he has the work ethic to coach it somewhere like West Virginia that you've got to travel – I mean, just it's basically a twenty-four. It's almost a twenty-four day job yeah. coaching West Virginia because you never stop traveling. So. Yeah, not not succeeding at or not succeeding at a high level at West Virginia doesn't mean you're a bad coach. It just means you're you're not cut out for that. And Dana Hargerson wasn't cut out for the grind that it takes to be, uh, you know, on the next level as far as being a good head coach at West Virginia. So yeah, I, I think Houston fits him perfectly. And, you know, Dana Holgerson didn't tell West Virginia to go kick rocks. What he did was he approached West Virginia and wanted a race, and West Virginia declined him. That's when he went to Houston because they offered him more money. So, you know, the stories were all oh, Dana Holgerson, you know, uh, he, he, you know, said he didn't want to be at West Virginia anymore and just left and took off. That's not what happened. He wanted a race. West Virginia declined, and he took the money in Houston. Well, and, he pretty you know, yeah, I know. He pretty much said that in a Sports Illustrated article, though. I think that's yeah, that's one of the reasons our fan base wouldn't hate him so much had he not done that interview with Sports Illustrated and basically talked crap about a school that, 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 that gave him his first coaching job. And that's he what me off about it. I think that was but the same. He gave him his first opportunity to be a head coach and got him where he's at now, and he had to crap on us when he left. That's that's kind of what what took me off. And wasn't that the same article where he said that West Virginia will never be able to recruit at a decent level? He said they would never be able to recruit at a high enough level to win the Big 12. That's the reason, one of the reasons he right. wanted out. That's it. I remember that. Now, we'll see if he's right. Obviously, Neil Brown's recruiting better than him already as far as numbers. Oh, yeah. We'll see, you know, we'll see what he can do with it on the field. Absolutely. So uh, I wish we could kind of combine um, – Neil Brown's work ethic as far as recruiting and uh, Dana Holgerson's tenacity as far as being able to get, you know, these great JUCO transfers. If we can get that, you know, at the same time, my gosh. Now, I'm not saying build, build a team off of, you know, JUCOs. I'm just saying sometimes you have holes that you need to fill trying to get the highest talent available, and that's what Dana Holgerson was good at as far as JUCOs. It's just you can't build a sustainable team with JUCO. So I like the base that Neil Brown's building, but there's still holes that JUCOs can fill. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. So I don't know how much you guys on your respective YouTube channels have to deal with uh, other fan bases, but as you can imagine, <laughs> my, my viewership, it's just all over the place. It's a smorgasbord. So you get a little bit of this. There you go. Talk as pit <laughs> is here. Talk a little, yeah. uh, S-H-I-T there, right there from, uh, then you got, uh, yeah, you're going to like this though. Brian's not real happy. Sorry about that. I, I did make a connection. <laughs> Folks aren't too happy with Michigan. I, I get it. I get it. You know. By the way, that uh, super chat by Gregory King, uh, when is Mark Rogers going to get a West Virginia helmet to put on a shelf? Me and Joey are working on that. Me and Joey are working on that. We got him covered. We got him covered. We get a lot of people upset about what helmets I've got behind me. So, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So, we had a super chat. I want to make sure. So, yeah, we'll get that on the screen. Uh-huh. All right, Gregory, you heard it. They're going to hook me up. So, we'll be in good shape. We'll clear every other helmet. You don't need to look at another helmet. Just see the uh, the beautiful blue with the WVU in gold. You'll all be happy. You will yeah. all be happy. And I'll pay for a paint job for, for the gold, gold, and blue. Okay. <laughs> for your background. <laughs> All right. That'll work. Joey says that Cincinnati is 23 and three all time versus West Virginia. What? That might be true, but I'm, I, that's not during the Big East days. Uh, okay. Cincinnati and West Virginia didn't coexist in the Big East for very long. So he might be talking, you know, as many times as we played them, which I'm not sure, apparently 26 times, and we've dominated them. 
But in the short time that we were both in the Big East, it was actually uh, a pretty good little rivalry. Well, no, he's saying All Cincinnati's time. 23 and 3. I read that wrong. Well, either way, either way. No, I, I, I can't believe that. That uh. I think he, I think in a later comment he says he wrote that backwards. Okay. okay, that I can believe. But still, that's still more lopsided it, than. Oh yeah, I'm that's saying. really lopsided. I wouldn't have guessed that bad. But I, considering West Virginia's football history, top fifteen all time in wins, and what I know of West Virginia football, not that I'm an expert on the 1950s or anything, but I pretty much have a <laughs> down from about the late 70s on, and all the coaches that uh, Coos mentioned. I, West Virginia's obviously had. Uh, a successful football program or Cincinnati's been all over the place, but playing at a different level, different level of football for most of that time, uh, playing more of a mid major kind of football. Uh, They're at their highest the level right now. Yes, right now. Absolutely. Cincinnati hasn't been this Cincinnati for their entire existence. Right now is the pinnacle of Cincinnati football. We're, we're seeing it right now. Absolutely. Uh, Jason, uh, West Virginia should have kept a rotation of teams on their schedule that they have a history with, like Maryland, Syracuse, Pitt, Virginia Tech. I agree with that. 100%. Yeah, and they're trying, and they're and they're in the process of fixing that. We've got obviously we have Virginia Tech and Maryland both this year. We had Maryland last year. We've got Virginia Tech and Pitt next year. Then we follow that up with Pitt and Penn State. I think it's Penn State. Yep. Uh, so That's they're right. trying. Uh, it took them a few years to get there. But they are they're trying to get their non conference games against regional teams and rivalry rival rivalry teams. Yeah. But they're the even trying to throw East Carolina they there. to offset the traveling they do in their uh conference games and also to try to try to get some of those rivalries back at least every few years anyway. September third, everyone, mark it down. Even if you're not a West Virginia football fan, you should if you love college football, this should mean something to you. West Virginia at Heinz Field against Pitt, September 3rd. I'm going to be there to talk as Pitt. <laughs> and that yeah. and that's the first matchup with uh, Pitt since when? Uh, 2013 or 2014. Okay. Yeah, I think so. 2013. I'm the, I'm the new fella. <laughs> uh, the new fella is uh, Coos, and if you don't know who he is, you need to go check out his channel. It is exploding right now. Uh, so yeah, you will know his name, uh, regularly here real soon. I don't know about that, but thank you for the kind words. Golden blue dude. I appreciate oh, yeah. that. He's uh, you're doing great over there, man. Amazing. You're doing way better than what I was doing at, at the point that I was at, um, same time frame as you are. So well, you're ahead of the curve, man. You're I, ahead I, of I hit it at the right time. I'm on YouTube. YouTube itself has blown up, has blown up in the past year after COVID. Yep. And, exactly. uh, and I've had a lot of help, guys like you and others that have supported me. So, me and me and Coos were talking earlier, and whenever I started this channel, the biggest thing that I ran into was the roadblock of being a West Virginia fan. Oh, he's a West Virginia fan. He's a dumb hillbilly. He don't know mm -hmm. what he's talking about. And then, you know, in our own conversations, we know that it's you have to earn the trust of the West Virginia fan base before they hit that subscribe button. So it was a combination of you know, the grind of earning trust and then having the label of being a hillbilly West Virginia fan. So I consider myself and Coos kind of a trailblazer, uh, you know, knocking down those uh, stereotype, uh, you know, boundaries, blockades, whatever you want to call it, so that people realize, hey, just because they're a West Virginia fan doesn't mean that they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to college football. Well, the other thing is sometimes you get judged by how many people watched your video or how many subscribers you have. Yeah. So um, I suddenly got smarter with 30,000 subscribers rather than 300 <laughs> subscribers. Me too. Uh, I used to get those kind of comments. I don't, I don't get them anymore, but I used to get all sorts of comments. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. You got 100 subscribers and they <laughs> make some kind of joke. And I'd be like, why don't you just watch and exactly. listen? And then you can, then if you, think after watching a couple of videos, I don't know what I'm talking about. That's fine, but at least give me a chance. You know? Yeah, I agree with that hundred percent. People don't understand the steps of YouTube. Like the beginning is always the worst because you, you could have the greatest content, know what you're talking about, but Oh, he's only got like what? 28 subscribers. This guy sucks. I ain't clicking that. I ain't even watching. Yeah. 
Uh, so you got to grind and grind and grind, and then all of a sudden you get to a thousand. Uh, I guess he's okay. I'll, I'll, if I have time, I'll check it out. Grind and grind and grind. Now I'm at five thousand. Uh, let's see what this moron's talking about. <laughs> Mike 3883, he's here all the time uh, supporting the channel. Appreciate you being here. So he's looking for the link to the West Virginia channel. Uh, I dropped it in the live chat at the start of the show. So you should be able to find it there if you can go back that far. And I will I'll try to do it. it again. Can you pin it? If you pin it, it'll stay up. I tried to pin it, but it won't let me. Okay. You probably have to wait to the live streams over to pin it, maybe. Oh, that's right. That's right. Or you have to do it at the very beginning. Yeah, maybe so. I'm Joey, not 100% sure, but that might be the case. I think Joey got it. Joey. So I'm going to ask everybody in here, since there are a lot of non-West Virginia fans, I'll just ask them flat out, as I always do, so they're used to this. Okay, if you're a West Virginia fan, it goes without saying. You need to subscribe to the West Virginia channel, The Boys of College Football. You're going to hear a little bit from me, but mostly you're going to hear from Coos. You're going to hear from Golden Blue Dude. A lot of great stuff out of them that's going to matter. So I'll chime in from time to time as well. But mostly from these guys that know what they're talking about concerning the Mountaineers. If you're not a West Virginia fan and you support us here at the Voice of College Football, this is what I'm asking. Go subscribe to the West Virginia channel, please. Even if you're a Michigan fan, you're a Kansas State fan, you're a Stanford fan, whoever you root for, please help us build the network here at the Voice of College Football. And I'll make you a deal. If you go over there and subscribe, once we get well cleared of a thousand subscribers, if it really bothers you to be subscribed to a channel that uh, of a team that you're not rooting for, then you can unsubscribe. But it's a key metric in YouTube to get us to a thousand subs. So please yep. head on over there and subscribe to our West Virginia channel at the Voice of College Football. Even if you don't watch a single minute of it, just hit the subscribe. We get to a thousand. We get well past it. Unsubscribe. There we go. <laughs> And for everybody that's commenting to tell you, I, I'm not able to comment, uh, but for everybody who's on here saying I'm already subscribed, thank you. We we all thank yes. you. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone listening that um, that helped us get to 1,000 just in the last couple of days on our USC channel. Thank you for that. Nice. Appreciate that. Very good, very good. All right. What do you guys expect out of the transfer portal or – what do you hope out of the transfer portal in the next few months? Well, for me, it's it's just making sure that we get the best players available that fit to what Neil Brown wants to do. Um, I'm hearing a lot of talk about, you know, hearing that Tyson – how do you pronounce his last name? Is it Begint oh, or Begent? Oh, somebody Begent. else. I'm sorry. Begent. Uh, he's, considered, Begent. he's considered – the best quarterback in the state of West Virginia, and he went to Shepherd University. He's in the transfer portal. Uh, last year, he threw for over 5,000 yards and 53 touchdowns. So, you know, not trying to run Nico off at all. I think he's the future of West Virginia. I'm just hesitant on throwing him immediately into the fire. That's a tall order for a, a true freshman on a real on a rebuilding program. I don't want him. I don't want him to stun his growth or regress. So if we could get somebody like that that could help him along a little bit and then hand the reins over to him when he's ready, that's the stuff that I'm looking for because we're still in transition. But if we can get some people that can show the people that are helping the transition and then we're smoothly into it, then it's, you know, the transition isn't going to be as, as uh, painful as what it seems like right now. So players that fit and that can teach this incoming great recruiting class we have a lot of talent coming in but we're still you know we're still rebuilding so we need guys that can show them the way they have the talent they just don't have the experience when it comes to this level of football uh, you can say whatever you want about west virginia uh but we're at a high level whether we play at a high level that's a different story but we exist at a high level of college football and so some of these guys can get shell-shocked that their growth can get stunted as far as, you know, how they perform on the field. They can regress unless you have the right people there to, you know, lead the way. I agree. I actually, to plug myself, I just, just did a video, uh, published a video today about this topic. Not so allowed to do that, Coos. No <laughs> plugging your own stuff. No, no. As far as the, uh, as far as the quarterback position, there are, 
uh, I was looking through because I don't I don't want a guy to come in. I mean, obviously, if Caleb Williams wants to come to WV, I'm going to welcome him with open arms, right? We yeah. know that's not happening. Right. So, but if I, my point there is, unless it's somebody like a Caleb Williams who's just phenomenal, I don't want to bring in a quarterback that still has three to four years of eligibility because then Nico's going to, going to bail. Goose Crowder might bail. Even Garrett Green. I mean, we might lose everybody, right? Then we have one quarterback on on the roster. I, I think you're hurting your your depth chart by doing that. But like Golden Blue Dude was talking, if you bring in somebody that only has one to maybe two years of eligibility left, that has some experience, in the video I did, there's some there's still some guys in the portal that aren't necessarily uh, everyday names that you know about, uh, but are have had some success at at the Power Five level in that portal that only have one or two years of experience left. And a couple of them I think would be good fits at West Virginia. One being Baylor Romney from BYU. He's completed oh, wow. his passes in three seasons. He's dual threat. He's about 25 years old, for crying out loud, because he did a mission trip. I mean, you talk about somebody that can provide leadership to a to an 18-, 19-year-old quarterback room. You're looking at that guy. You've got uh, – And he learned from Zach Wilson, too. Yeah, exactly. Then you've got uh, – the guy from uh, Minnesota, Zach Anikstad, who backed up Tanner Morgan. He actually started at Minnesota before he got injured. Tanner Morgan took over for him. Well, guess who recruited Zach Anikstad? Kirk Soraka, who was our analyst last year, yep. who went back to Minnesota, who's good friends with Neil Brown. They run the same, basically the same offense. Yep. He would likely be a fit. And the one that I don't, the one that I wouldn't mind seeing because of he would be an exciting player to watch, but I don't know that he'd be a fit would be John Reese. Plumley out of o- Ole Miss. Ooh, Actually played yeah. with Coach Rod at Ole Miss in twenty. How many years does he have left? I think he's got two. Yeah, that would that'd be kind of right on that line. But he don't but, have – the problem with him is he's pretty much – his passing numbers, he's like he, – he's completed only about 50% of his passes. Yeah. But he rushed for over 1,000 yards in 2019. So he's more of a – but he done that under Rich Rodriguez, and we know the kind of offenses he runs. Yep. So – I, I don't know. I, I think Neil Brown prefers a pass-first quarterback. I, and plus, we've already got Garrett Green, who can run at that position. I don't think we need two quarter, two running quarterbacks in the quarterback room. So I, I don't know that he'd be a great fit. But he was inter, he's an inter, interesting uh, name in the portal that still fits that veteran <laughs> veteran mold. And he and oh, by the way, he plays baseball in West Virginia. Happens to have a really good baseball program too. Oh, there you go. I didn't even John, think about that. John Rice Plumley is so versatile. That last season, uh, he was the backup quarterback to Matt Corral. And then during the bowl season, they had so many opt-outs at wide receiver. They played him at wide receiver in the slot yep. against Indiana in mm-hmm. a bowl game. And he caught like eight passes. He caught the pass that led to the game-winning touchdown. He like looked like he was Hunter Renfro. I'm exaggerating. But he, he, looked, looked, starter. he, looked, that, he looked like a starter in the SEC. Uh, stepping in from quarterback to slot receiver for a bowl game against a good team. And uh, so, so he can play. Uh, I've got a trivia question for anybody in the live chat or for you two. Now that uh, Coos has mentioned the name Zach Anikstead, um, do you know what Zach Anikstead and Baker Mayfield have in common? Oh, let me think. Hmm. That's a good one, Mark. Wow. Stump the uh, chunk. I'm trying to think off the top of my head, and I can't do it. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, uh, let's see. It's Can probably think... something obvious, too. It's probably yeah. something obvious, and I can't uh, get it. I think when I say it, it might seem obvious, but it's still pretty tough. Anybody in the chat? Anybody in the chat? Anybody in the chat? Nick Stead and Baker Mayfield, what do they do? have in common i'm with joey said, I, i'm thinking it might and this is just a total guess but maybe they went to the same high school yeah that's what joey said no it's more rare than that they are the oh. only two people that have ever done this oh wow they are um, the only two people in the history of college football let me see if i can get it mark hold on hold on hold can on. i try can i answer it or do you want me to wait and see what the people let, in the let's see if anybody answered this in the i think okay. i'm i think i may know it based on the research same, i did on him same father but but I, I, I'm not going to answer yet. Same father. Uh, <laughs> oh, I like the 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 okay, Eric some, somebody I, somebody I think I know the answer. on part of it, but they're they're not even close. But they've touched on one of the aspects of what makes those two players I, I know, unique. Yeah, that's that's I know the answer. I I know where you're going. I know the answer. I think. 
All right. I mean, anybody else? Anybody else? I actually, actually, else? I actually mentioned Girl, him in the video. On the Heisman winner? Nope. Nope. That's not it. Mark, I'm dying to answer, man. Come on. Okay. You you give it a shot, and then I'll I'll tell you. Well, they're the only two quarterbacks that have walked on and started as freshmen. Uh, yeah, that's almost exactly what it is. Started the first game true of freshman. their college career as a walk-on true freshman. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yep. Now I do. I didn't. I actually didn't know that about Baker Mayfield. The only reason I knew about Enix that was because it came up in my research for my video. Okay. Yep. 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 That's what they have in common. Interesting. That's cool. I don't think Zach Annex said it's making quite as much money. I didn't know that about him. Right no, but, uh, <laughs> but, but he's also not that. getting sacked as much right now. So, uh, Cheryl, you know we love you. She is subscribed. She's a diehard Ohio State fan, and she – she subscribes to all the channels to the point where she's even subscribed to the Michigan channel. So if she can do oh, that. Wow. wow. And that... then you got uh, Coach Jake says, uh, love subscribing to the different team channels, school channels to keep up with what's happening around the country. Yeah, so, and you yeah. can get a different feel for the different cultures. That's, that's why I loved um, starting this YouTube channel because uh, even on Facebook, I'm a member of like 400 different Facebook groups. And – you don't realize whenever you're part of a specific fan base that you're in this bubble. And then when you go visit other bubbles and see what's in that bubble, you're like, they do what? What's going on over there? Uh, Pre-game ritual, their chants, you know, how they think, you know, it's, it's like a different world. So mm -hmm. uh, I like that comment. Definitely. It, it's good to be subscribed to different uh, channels of different teams because it gets you out of your comfort zone, out of your bubble to see how other people think. And you also see which fan bases have nice fans and which ones are. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I will say this every clean. fan base does have that at least core little percent that are absolute, you know. Yeah. Idiot. But if 90% of the people from a certain fan base is negative on your comments, Oof. that pretty much tells you that most of the fan base is yep. like that, in my opinion. Are we naming name names? Bearcats. <clears throat> Cincinnati Bearcats. Hmm. Mm. I got I crap. I have the crap from Cincinnati eye, fans. I get crap from Cincinnati fans more than any other fan base. Wow. I'm trying to think real For some quick. reason. I don't know why. They just I they never will, guessed it. They, they nitpick little tiny things in a video that if you're not exactly perfect. Yeah. Perfect. And I've had I a couple trolls that. from Cincinnati. The troll troll all my videos and make stupid comments. Dude, Iowa State was the worst. I actually got kicked off of uh I got kicked out of their Facebook group because I suggested that eventually Matt Campbell could get hired by a different uh, university. This, that's when his name was really, really hot. It's cooled right. down just a little bit, but he was a hot name at one time, and I suggested that this team might come after him. This, Oh, no, 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 that's negative. Booted me out. Yeah, wow. Yep. i tell you who's been the nicest so far, I think, is Minnesota fans. Minnesota. I was about to say that. Dude. They are fantastic. Minnesota. They have treated me other than one guy that come. Actually, he was commenting on your video the other day, Chris. Uh, I keep calling you Chris. My bad. But anyway, the comment on your video the other day. Uh, most Minnesota fans have been have been super super nice. I think he apologized for that though. Did he? Yeah. Good. Yeah, I think uh, Minnesota has those uh, some of those friendly Canadian fans that come down over the border and you know. That's what it, I think. That's what it is. That's what it is. Or, or they're or it's rubbing off on them. You know, they're so close to Canadians and it's it's rubbing off yeah. on them. Good fan base. Very nice. I agree. I think there's a lot of similarities there in our cultures. That's why we. Yeah, I can see that. Blue chip, hardworking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like it. Uh, have the potential to have a, a successful football program, but it takes a grind to do it. Yes. Uh, appreciation whenever they do have that person, whenever they do have those players um, that put in the, the work and effort to have a great team. Yeah. Because uh, and, and I'm not trying to trash talk Alabama fans. It is what it is. Alabama's always been a great, you know, football school. They always have 18 national championships. But they're at a point to where they just expect it. You know, it I, I'm not saying that they don't appreciate it. Not at all. I'm sure they do. But it's almost like, yeah, that's what's supposed to happen. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Whereas at West Virginia or in Minnesota, Wisconsin, 
you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're the type of team where we, when we start seeing a great team, we're like, man, thank you for staying here for one thing. And then thank you for putting in the work, you know? If you guys ever had uh, Georgia stop Georgia here, the Gator yep. fans stop by your channel. Okay. All right. Very you know if you're familiar with George. George is one of a kind. Yeah, I don't think yeah. I don't recognize the name, but yeah. he's over on Lou's show a lot. George, good old George. He's on what? He's on Uncle Lou's show oh, okay. a lot. Yeah. George pointing out that he's 61 years old, and uh, when he was 14, I was five or six playing on dirt piles. And he was the starting wrestler at Atlanta High School. <laughs> George will born, come up man. with these comments. It's all over the place. Yeah, I wasn't born. You all right. All right, boys. Uh, unless there's anything else you guys wanted to hit on tonight, we certainly have plenty of off season to get to it. Yeah, um, let's uh, let's uh, pace ourselves. I think we had a good show. <laughs> Yeah, I, sure I there'll will. Be more, there'll be more news coming out in the next few weeks. I'm sure with coaching changes, oh, and yeah, transfer portal stuff, and bigger stuff. I'm telling you, yeah. bigger stuff. Okay, everybody, listen to what Golden Blue Dude just said. So we're gonna say, yep, big stuff impacting okay. West Virginia football. Big, big. All right, yeah. appreciate everybody being here. Wait, wait, one more big, one yep. more big, one more big. big. There you go. Big. Okay. Big. All right. I don't, I think it's bigger than that, but I'll, we'll give you some more. Huge. Huge. <laughs> Huge. That would have taken the place. They put a couple Huge. bigs, maybe Huge. two or three. Huge. <laughs> huge. Really huge. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to start thinking of some words now. <laughs> Enormous. And that's it. That's it right there. You got it. Justin Coos Walker, where can they find you? Coos's Corner on YouTube, spelled C O U Z apostrophe S. I saw somebody ask that earlier. Spelled we'll C O U Z, not C O O Z. Uh, Coos's Corner is my channel. And then if you want to, if it's easier to reach me on Twitter, I'm at Coos, C O U Z 206. And there's a link there to my channel as well. And like he needs any introduction, but uh, Golden Blue Dude, just in case anybody's not over there, subscribe to you. Just in case you haven't seen my annoying face before, I'm on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and of course, YouTube as Golden Blue Dude, of course. And by the way, I would encourage y'all to go check out Kuz's Corner. It's it's a good channel. Oh, and congratulates to Golden Blue Dude for hitting 5,000 subscribers yesterday. Nice. Congratulations. Awesome. Appreciate it, guys. And for anybody that's uh, been dragged over here by these two, uh, I got my little channel here, so if you see anything that you like, jump on in. Huge. huge. All right, guys. It's been fun. It has been. Have a great yeah. weekend. That was fun. You Take too, later. Have a great weekend. All righty.